Okay, so it's nearly lunchtime. Uh, probably like me, regretting that one extra whiskey and feeling a little bit hungry. Um, but I'm going to take you through a very, very common presentation in exams. Um, I collect patients for our course in Chesterfield that we run, and the, when the FRCS was in Chesterfield, we got patients. Patients with a peripheral nerve injury um, are very good for clinical cases, um, and so you'll almost certainly see one in any exam course you come to. To follow on what, from what Joe was saying, you will either get examine this patient's hands, in which case you'll be doing your screening, you're looking for clues, hopefully spotting something that gives you a direction to go, and then you say to the examiner, I'd like to examine this patient's ulnar nerve, and you go on and do an ulnar nerve examination. The other option is the examiner says to you, examine this patient's ulnar nerve, which is that business where it's great because you know what to do, but obviously you're expected to do it very slickly and efficiently in order to get the marks. In order to achieve a peripheral nerve examination effectively, you've got to know the anatomy. And what I'm going to show you is an examination for each of the nerves that hopefully allows you to explain to the examiner what you're doing and why you're doing it with relation to different parts of each of the nerves. There's essentially three peripheral nerves, but we'll talk about deltoid and musculocutaneous, the other two sort of terminal branches of the brachial plexus a little bit. And just to extend that further, you can imagine or remember that each of the peripheral nerves has a bifurcation therefore giving you three main parts of the nerve to examine. So as part of your examination, you want tests, sensory, motor, or special to examine each of those parts of the nerve from proximal to distal. And the important thing with the examination for this is that your testing peripherally is giving you clues and telling you what's happening proximally. So you're trying to identify which bits of the nerve are functioning or not functioning. In most cases, the pathology is, is either a compression nerve uh, neuropathy or a traumatic um, thing, either stabbing, iatrogenic, plating, Holstein Lewis, that sort of thing. So, as we've said before, look, feel, move. In this case, inspection is pretty useful and usually can uh, help you guide your examination. I think with palpation and uh, special tests and provocative tests, things that are going to cause pain are generally best done at the end. But it's just important to remember uh, to do them. So if we go through each nerve just briefly, and we can practice them this this afternoon, uh, I think the important things for peripheral nerves is to think of the attitude of the hand, where there's muscle wasting, scars, and looking for the splints, because these patients often have got a splint around. So with the radial nerve, uh, looking for wrist drop. The places to palpate, as has been said before, possibly you may want to consider a, a PIN syndrome and palpate just distal to the lateral epicondyle. And the superficial nerve can be trapped in Wartenberg syndrome at the wrist. This is the key slide for each of the nerves, which if you can com commit to memory, you can have a system that you can follow and explain to the examiner why you're doing each bit and you're testing logically in a sequence from proximal to distal. So with the radial nerve, the only sensory component is the superficial radial nerve. So if that sensation is intact, the superficial radial nerve is intact and the clue is that that gives you the idea that the proximal part will be intact, otherwise the sensation wouldn't be intact. And then for each of the nerves, we've got five tests or muscles to examine. And working from proximal to distal, you have a sequence of testing these muscles, identifying where the pathology is and which bit of functioning. One of the most uh, important cases we try to get, or which is very common for exams, is a sort of Holstein-Lewis. So a patient who's got a posterior scar of the upper arm with a resolving radial nerve lesion is fantastic. So somewhere down this path, the radial nerve is recovering. And we've got one of those in two weeks, thankfully, on our course. 
And what you need to do is practice this sequence so that it becomes totally routine and you can work your way from one to the other, testing these five muscles. And this isn't exhaustive, and often we get asked, well, what about this muscle or what about that muscle? But the idea is that you, you have a sequence that you're clear in your mind that by testing <coughs> brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus, you're testing the main trunk of the radial nerve before the posterior nerve comes off, and then working down. And as I say, we'll do this this afternoon where you can practice on each other and, and, and the sequence of brachioradialis, extensor, radi extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi ulnaris, indices, and then EPL. And so five things. Most of the time in this talk, when I've given it before, I've invented two or three new muscles, and you probably will do that in the exam yourself. <laughs> so for the ulnar nerve, um, with inspection, I think the ulnar nerve probably has most things to see. You've already seen uh, my hairdresser patient here who had a paediatric elbow fracture who presented with tardy ulnar nerve palsy. She's been to exam courses. She has the cubitus valgus and a cubital tunnel scar. So she's a fantastic case, and then you go on and examine the nerve. We'll look at the attitude of the hand with these two things in a minute, um, and obviously you're looking for first dorsal interosseous wasting. I think it's really difficult when you do the screening, and what I find people tend to say, there's a little bit, possibly some wasting of the dorsal interosseous, and obviously and it can be difficult to get the clue. In you know, elderly people's hands, there's often looks like there's wasting, and trying to decide whether that's relevant or not, it can be difficult. Wartenberg sign is supposed to be an early sign of ulnar nerve dysfunction, the little finger escape sign. Um, and so if you see that, you can mention it and understand why it happens. And so you can explain to the examiner which muscles aren't working and why you've got the deforming force. This is a favorite in the exams. It's a favorite for getting wrong and it's fantastic to trip yourself up over. And you need to talk to the dog, the mirror, anybody who'll listen, and repeatedly explain what chlorine is and why it occurs and what the ulnar paradox is. And again, we could talk about that, but you need a phrase, one of these phrases, to try and be able to cl be clear in your mind. Everybody seems to get confused with the ulnar paradox or discuss whether it is because the nerve is getting better and the chlorine gets worse, it is also, so that's the same as saying is it, it's a high or a low lesion. So it really is the same thing, the paradox, the fact that when FDP starts working, the chlorine gets worse. So if you have the lesion is high, then you get less chlorine because FDP's not working. <coughs> but, you've got to, but explaining that can be quite tricky. So for the ulnar nerve, there are a few classic examination things, and sensation is one of them whereby you examine over the dorsum of the fifth metacarpal and you examine the tip of the little finger. If the sensation is present in um, the dorsum of the fifth metacarpal but not in the tip of the little finger, it suggests that the pathology is in Guillaume's canal or distal to where the sensory branch comes off. If they're both affected, then it's <coughs> perhaps more proximal. And again, You've got five things to do, which will test the trunk before Guillaume's canal in the hand, and then the classic test of Froman's test. So you can have a sequence which flows down the hand of testing plexicarpi ulnaris, testing FDP to the little finger, abductor digiti minimi, first dorsal interosseous, and crucially, you can see palpating the muscle as well and then go on to demonstrate Froman's test. And you can say to the examiner that why you're doing each of these and which bit of the nerve you're testing. Froman's test is again something you need to be able to perform and as been said earlier on, demonstrate to your patient what you want them to do and explain to the examiner why flexion of the IP joint of the thumb is a positive test because they're recruiting the anterior interosseous nerve. This traditionally was done with Le Monde but more recently it works much better with a clinical examination book with Ali written on the front. Um, but anything like that will work. For the median nerve, um, carpal tunnel scars are incredibly common, um, but 
quite difficult to see, so look for those. Um, abduct pollicis brevis wasting is the most likely thing you're going to see, um, and they may have splints. It's worth thinking about all of the scars proximally in the arm that are relevant for these nerve injuries um, because, again, would we bring those to the exams if they've got a scar, either traumatic or surgical, that can be the same thing, um, and peripheral nerve lesions, um, they're very good for cases for the exam. And thinking of um, palpation in the proximal arm where there may be compression of the uh, median nerve. So for the median nerve, you can differentiate whether the problem is in the carpal tunnel by sensory testing in the tip of the index finger or the base of the thena muscle, in theory. And then by testing these five muscles, you can differentiate where along the course of the median nerve the problem might be and which bits are working. So FCR and FDS in the forearm, opponens and abductor pollicis brevis in the hand, and then the OK sign for the anterior interosseous nerve. And again, the OK sign, you need to be able to explain what the positive finding is and why when you ask the patient to pinch, the IP joints collapse into extension because they aren't able to use FPL and FTP to the index. So in summary, if you have these in your head, and you get asked specifically to examine one of these nerves, you have a routine that you can follow rather than, as Mr. Garcia said, a sort of random scattergun approach to just examining some muscles. This gives you a system whereby you can do things in order and there is a reason for doing the things in terms of where the pathology is in the nerve. For any junior members here, who I'm sure many of you have already worked out this and perhaps used it in your clinical practice, certainly for young children with supracondylar fractures, that sort of thing, just by asking the patient to point across their finger and do the OK sign, which generally children uh, can follow you do, you can do a very gross screening of the nerves. And just to finish, to remind you of the essential anatomy and the other two peripheral nerves, um, the axillary nerve with the regimental badge area and testing deltoid, and the musculocutaneous nerve if you've got loss of sensation along the la lateral border of the forearm, and a scar from an antralateral approach to plater humerus, then it may be a musculocutaneous nerve problem. Thank you. clinical examination before I explain what, what we're going to do. Any, 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 any burning questions? Or you can ask them in the afternoon. Uh, okay. The, the plan will be to, we, we'll put a stand. Um, these, these are three, group one, two, and three on, will be on this side. These are for core trainees, ST3 and ST4s. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, if you fill it out on that side, on, on this side, uh, four. Um, uh, group four, five, and six uh, will be um, will be the, the more senior trainees who are F who are peri FRCS, and uh, people. Some people here are more senior; that they have their exams and so on. Are senior, uh, for example, they've come for uh, they teach clinical examination or they're here for revalidation uh, with regards to medical legal practice. Then you can hang around with the with the uh, senior trainees. And obviously, when it comes around, you don't need questions, so you, you can identify that you won't, uh, you won't be quizzed. The, the whole aim on a Friday afternoon, uh, the end of a BOA, is not to make it stressful for you, to make it enjoyable. So, so you stick together in pairs and, and practice your examination. Nobody will be given a hard time, unless you specifically want to be quizzed at the level of the FRCS, or, or we will do that for you too, if you want, if you want that. Okay, so um, we're finished about 10 minutes early, so that's great. So if you come back at one, f fill, out, fill in these forms, okay? So junior guys, please this way. And then come back at 1.30, and we all want to finish by 4, okay?